Next, I will introduce Dr. Leona Gilbert. She's presenting Tick-Borne Disease Diagnostics, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Welcome. Interesting enough, World Health Organization has indicated that 64 million people died in 2015 because of lack of healthcare services that you and I are used to. This includes pharmaceuticals, this includes diagnostics, this includes healthcare centers for them to go to. Interesting enough, if you look at these people and you look at people globally, 45% of the global population actually lack access to these healthcare ser services you and I are used to. And if we think about the 64 million deaths, they are because of chronic infections, chronic communicable, chronic non-communicable diseases. And in that context, we need to think about Lyme disease and tick-borne diseases. You are aware that when the tick bites you, it has the potential to actually pass on multiple microbes, such as Borrelia, Babesia, tick-borne encephalitis, that can cause multiple tick-borne diseases. It's not just Lyme. And that's the point I want to stress here. It's not just Lyme. The problem with tick-borne diseases is this. These are statistics, facts. Every 120 seconds, someone in Europe is being diagnosed with a tick-borne disease. Yes, you heard me right. Every 120 seconds, somebody is being diagnosed with a tick-borne disease. That number in the United States, for those American friends, every 96 seconds. And those Chinese friends, every two seconds, someone in China is being diagnosed with a tick-borne disease. This is outrageous. We need to do something about this. Interesting enough, if you look where the reported cases are, look at this map. Reported cases of tick-borne diseases. Interesting, look at Australia. There are no patients there suffering from tick-borne diseases. Come on, this is ridiculous. But, take it, but really look at these numbers. These are reported cases. The problem with reported cases, there is not a standardized protocol for every single country in the world to report these cases. There isn't. So these numbers are grossly underestimated, as WHO has highlighted. And these numbers are only going to increase because of climate change, because we are in the nature more and more often. And also, the hosts that the ticks feed on, they're spreading across the globe. It's interesting enough, a recent paper this year by DeLong has estimated that 2 million patients in the United States by 2020 will have post Lyme disease syndrome. That's a lot less than the 20% that the CDC estimated. 2 million! Okay, well, statistically speaking, I did an analysis as well. By 2050, 35% of the global population will have a tick-borne disease. This is not conjecture. This is based on statistical analysis, the recent publication of the trends that are coming out now. This number is outstanding, and we need to do something about it. And now is the time to do something about it so that we prevent chronic conditions associated with a tick bite. To add to the problem, patient advocacy groups in the states have testified in court that it takes 11 different visits, up to 11 different doctors, up to 11 different tests, to get that one proper diagnosis. <laughs> we are failing the patients with this. This is ridiculous. And it's costing states, governments, 20 billion euros to manage these patients. We can do a lot better for the state, for the governments, and for the patients. We can do better by, well, very simple steps. And I'll let you know in the next few slides. To add to this, this is where the problem leads. We all know this, the two-tier system. I'm, I live in Finland, and guess what? The Finnish government follows this two-tier system. It's flawed, we know it's flawed. How many of you guys are surprised that it's fall, flawed? We're not surprised, but it is. On an average, it takes a minimum two tests to get a proper diagnosis through this two-tier system. The sensitivity is bad. We had comments earlier about the sensitivity. What does that really mean? Because it has to be compared to a reference test. It's true. And the grouping of the patients to actually get these numbers are subjective. Sure, fine. But if you look at, actually at the two-tier system, on the left-hand side, side is the Elisa. 
Enzyme Links Camino Assay. It's quite sensitive. It's automated, okay, but it can mit, miss a lot of cases. The antigens that are used, the proteins that they use are very different in different countries. We know this. So, of course, the testing in Finland is different than the testing in the United States, than different testing in Canada. Even in Finland alone, there are different testing protocols, different ELISA in one city than the next. This is ridiculous. Only 200 kilometers separates these two cities, and they're using different tests. They're testing for Borrelia absolute in Turku, and they're t testing Borrelia garini in Helsinki. Why? Why aren't we testing all three major species of Borrelia? Western blot, okay, can be specific. It lacks sensitivity, as we know, because it's very subjective. Which band are we looking at? It's labor intensity, sometimes difficult to interpret, and it's not really ideal for standardization. So we have problems with this. While I'm a scientist, I like challenges, so I want to try to improve this. In addition to the problems with diagnostics, you can see actually the reported sensitivity and specificity here on some of these tests. And it's funny because none of these sensitivities or specificities that are reported here are in peer-reviewed journals. They are on their white papers or IFUs, instructions for use. And it's interesting, if you look at this 100% sensitivity, uh, uh, really? In what, 10 cases? So it's good to know what, what, what samples they're using to get this, these numbers, these performance criteria, the number of patients that are being used here, what are the antigens that are being used here, and so forth. Because this publication by Cook and Prairie in 2016 has indicated that the sensitivity ELISAs have only increased 44% in the last 20 years to this 62.3%. That's the average sensitivity of ELISAs that are peer-reviewed, not these ones that are not peer-reviewed up there. But these are quite encouraging ELISAs and sensitivities and specificities, okay? It builds confidence in some, some clinicians that are reading this and needing to interpret this. So the real problem with tick-borne diseases is that the diagnostics are slow. It can take up to months to get a proper diagnosis. They're expensive. On an average, in Finland, 300 euros to get that one test, one diagnosis. And that's because they're not updated with the scientific literature, which means the scientific research states that patients are not just suffering from Borrelia. They're suffering from multiple microbes. We all know this, so why aren't the tests reflecting this? Some tests do. They test up to, let's say, three different co-infections, but that's about it. We need to do better for the patients. In addition, tests currently do not actually test for this form of Borrelia. Pleomorphic forms means these variant morphological forms that the Borrelia could have. Traditionally, it's a corkscrew-like structure, but it can change forms into these four pronounced forms. The cork-like, cork corkscrew-like structure. The Borrelia can also have these blebs that are very small, protruding out the membrane. Round bodies, which are about two microns in diameter. And these biofilm-like structures or microcolonies of other people are, are calling them. None, no existing test right now except for mine, tests for these pleomorphic forms. In addition to this, we have been seeing that pleomorphic forms have been called many different things, cell wall deficient, L forms. And I'm here to say that they are, they have a cell wall. If you take a look at this round body that has been induced with water, you can see that they have an intact cell wall. It's atypical, of course, but this is an electron microscope zoomed in image of the cell wall and it's intact. So some really good evidence to suggest this. It's not just one image. We have tons of these images. I show this. If you look at the round body that has been induced in human sera, again, you can see that it has an intact cell wall. To give more evidence that these are round bodies, we take a look actually at the flagella. The flagella, which are those motor proteins that allow that cork screw-like structure to move the Borrelia, they sit inside 
the internal membrane. You can see them in green here, and this is just a morphological picture that you can see. The round body that's induced with water, the green is inside. So it has an intact cell wall. So let's stop calling them cell wall deficient because they have a cell wall. Let's call them round bodies as they should. And again, you can see the same similar structure phenomena of the flagella is inside with human sera induced round bodies. And interesting enough with the round bodies, and this video is going to play, these round bodies actually revert back. If you take a little look at the round body here, we are not the only ones in the world to show this. There's lots of videos on the internet and published, okay, that show that, one more time please, that this round body actually rever reverts back into its parent form, that corkscrew-like structure. Yeah, that's a good question. This was taking about five years ago and I absolutely forgot. Yeah, I'm really sorry. We took the images real time, so, but I probably have, have slowed this down 10 times or 100 times. Yeah, because they are really, they revert back quite quickly. And they revert into round body formation quite quickly as well. So if you put them in an adverse environment, less than five minutes, they are in its round body form. All right, we're gonna now move forward. So we are, as I mentioned, we are not the only ones that have shown that these round bodies revert back to the parent form. And we have a hypothesis in my research group that this is the persistent form. This is a form that can actually cause havoc in these persistently suffering patients. And we're gonna test this hypothesis. But interesting enough, just recently, well, I, I can't say recently, there have been reports since 2003 that antibiotic tolerant Borrelia burgdorferi persisters exist. And recently, though, there have been accumulation of our colleagues sitting here from his lab actually showing that these persister forms these persisters exist and they are antibiotic tolerant and that they are important enough to actually take address to because this is probably this reactive arthritis-like symptoms may be because of these persisters. But we have an hypothesis, as I already mentioned, that we think the Borrelia round bodies are the persister forms or can, may be an additional persistent form, because I'm sure the microcolony has spiricates as well as round bodies, because round bodies in itself are capable of evading the immune system, induce in distinct cytokine profiles compared to its parent form, are metabolically inactive, have a dormant morphology. If you put that dormant round body into its natural environment and its natural media, it reverts back into spiricate and starts replicating. And we believe that the, it is, has a possible role in Lyme disease pathogenesis because it really can revert back to a parent form. We are not the only ones that have suggested this. There's tons of papers coming out right now that are suggesting that the round body is this persistent form, one of the persistent forms that can cause a pathogenesis in patients suffering from persistent infections associated with a tick bite. And this is a recent paper by Monica Embers that shows actually the persistent coming from an animal that has been treated with antibiotics. In addition, though, to cause more havoc with this testing, the test barely recognizes any co-infections that are coming from a tick bite. It's not just Lyme anymore. There's tons of research to suggest that these patients are suffering from more than just Lyme. Hashtag not just Lyme. But more interesting enough, these patients are also suffering from these opportunist infections. And we are not the only ones to have noticed that these patients, when their immune system is lowered, their CD57 markers are low, natural killers are low, or they're not actually producing a lot of IgG and IgM antibodies to combat infections, they are succumbing to these opportunist infections. It's like you and I going, going to the hospital and having surgery. We're more prone to opportunist infections or hospital-acquired diseases because our immune system is low. Same thing with these patients. This was our hypothesis, and we wanted to test this. So we did. 
We tested to see if these patients are suffering from not just Lyme, they're suffering from multiple microbes associated with a tick bite, so co-infections, and also could they be suffering also from these opportunist infections. And some GPs sitting here and clinicians sitting here are saying, yeah, we know this. Well, now we have a study that statistically evaluates this. And yeah, we look closely into the, the CDC defined cases to see if the CDC patients are actually suffering from these multiple microbes. So this is what we did. We evaluated the polymicrobial immune responses that the patients were suffering from of tick-borne diseases. We did not want to just look at Borrelia. We wanted to look at co-infections and opportunist infections. So what we did in this paper, we did a lot more, but what we did in this paper was we took 432 characterized patients or individuals. Let's call them individuals at the moment. And we tested them against 20 different microbes that we thought were relevant. We actually tested 15,000 patients against 40 different microbes, and we came down to what was significantly relevant. These patients well characterized against these 20 microbes that were statistically significant for us. And we wrote a paper. And we tested them in an ELISA platform, industry standard, right? We looked at the IgG and IgM for response. So what did we get? We first had to do, group them into a well-defined structure. The CDC acute cases, late cases, CDC negative cases, CDC defined unspecific cases. The reference is CDC. And also we had post-treatment Lyme disease group that were, of course, defined by IDSA. We took immunocompromised. These compromised individuals were, were tested against or with a CD or CE marked and IVD in vitro diagnostic mark, an FDA approved test, okay, for non-Borrelia microbes. The unspecific uh, control here also was tested against these CE and IVD marked tests. And then the healthy uh, controls here or individuals were used, tested against the CE, IVD, FDA marked tests, also also against the CDC criteria, and we use the healthy patients as used for our cutoff marks. It's very important to you have truly healthy patients or individuals, because are we really truly healthy? Well, that's very subjective, but we need something in evaluating the test performance. So this is what we did, and also this study was, the specimens were sourced cross-sectionally, Okay, which means that hopefully around the same point, same year, we took, we got these samples. They were leftover, okay, samples, but the data collection was retrospective. So we took the history afterwards. The samples were given to us based on these criteria, and then we got the information afterwards. All right, so some results. If you look on the left-hand side, this is the IgM response. On the right-hand side is the IgG response. So IgM first, then IgG. You can see with the IgM, we have 51% of these people responding to more than one microbe. In the IgG, it's 65%. This is profound. So 65% of the overall people that we tested are responding to multiple microbes. This is four times greater the, than just responding to one microbe. So polymicrobial characteristic in these patients is there. So, the multiple microbial characteristic is seen in all stages of the, the tick-borne diseases. So if we're calling IgM acute by standard textbook, okay, multiple microbe response there, and IgG for past or, or dissemination, it's there too. So multiple microbes are seen in early stages and late stages. So it, it's not just Lyme. And this actually, these results here, are actually correlating with published results seen with these papers that states 4 to 60% co-infection rate in these patients. So our findings are very, very kind of good. They're with the, with the other standards. Also though, then we were interested, of course, this persistent form. 
If you take a look at the IgM again on the left and IgG on the right, you can see we broke down the response individually by the spirit kits alone, the, the round body alone, 13% in IgM. When they are together, the multiple microbes, and then no response here. If you look at the IgG, we have 7% of the patients just responding to the spirit kit alone, 13% to the persistent form. This is saying that the tests right now are picking up 13% more, more because of this persistent form. And I'm sure it has an effect in, in when both of them are together. So the value of the persons, persistent forms in detection is very important, both in IgM and IgG. This is very important. And again, it's not just Lyme. Also in this data to show that multiple microbes on itself are very important here in, t in these individuals. And this data actually correlates well with this published article in 2016, where they evaluated all the American tests that were conducted, okay, over well around 3 million tests, sample tests were conducted, and they found that 17% of those tests were, were not Lyme tests at all. They were different multiple microbe tests. So this correlates quite well with our multiple microbe phenomenon that is being seen in these patients. So multiple microbe phenomenon, it's not just Lyme. So busy slide here, but take note. All the eight different, di different groups that we put these patients in and what they're suffering from individually, there's a correlation, co-occurrence. So if I walk you through just the top one, for those CDC positive patients that were put in this category, they are suffering, they have a 40% co-occurrence with Borrelli Bordorferi, 35 co-occurrence with absolutely Garini. And look at the persistent forms, a higher co-occurrence in acute cases, same with late stage. And you look at IgG, the persistent form is really co-occurrence nicely with these late stages. In addition, you can see actually other co-occurrence percentages of these other microbes. So the takeaway message is not to look at every single box here, is actually the shaded, darkest shaded areas are actually the takeaway message. And the takeaway messages are here. Three out of four CDC negative patients were positive for Borrelia persistent form. They're not just, it's not just Lyme. These guys are suffering from persistent, uh, while well, reacting to the persistent form of Borrelia. And then 95% of the post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome were positive for, again, the persistent form. So all the tests right now currently on the market, except for mine, it's not my phone, somebody's phone, is not testing for persistent form. We need to do better, and we have. In addition to this, those people that have Lyme disease, there is an 85% probability that they are suffering from multiple microbes. Any given Lyme disease individual here that's with a diagnosis, you have an 85% chance that you are suffering from multiple microbes. It's not just Lyme. This published article has been turned into a CE and IVD marked validated accredited test kit called TICFLEX. It is manufactured under ISO 13485. It's been independently validated in Germany, in Poland, in Netherlands, in US, in Finland now. Woohoo! And the more countries you go, it will be independently validated. And, okay, so 12 patents have been filed, whatever. But the whole point and concept of TICFLEX, it is testing up to 15 different microbes with the persistent forms. It tests multiple disease stages, if you want to call them disease stages, because that's contentious, IgM, IgG. But you don't need two separate tests for IgM and IgG. We believe in the power of IgM and IgG together. And also, it has a higher sensitivity, and I will show you. Okay, and these are the 
sensitivity and specificity criteria. We took reference tests that I will show you in, in a couple slides that German uses, that Netherlands uses, that Finland uses, the golden standard in those countries. And we tested them and compared them and analyzed the positive agreement and negative agreement between TICPLEX and our test kit. And these sensitivity and specificity is not only for this study, but it's also for the TICPLEX test. And it's also the sensitivity and specificity in these countries as well. OK, this is the positive agreement and negative agreement here. So this says that your test, this test is in a positive agreement with these standard tests by this percentage. OK? So we are looking at positive agreement at 56%, all the way up to the highest is 90%. Negative agreement that it's the negative, negative uh, diagnosis is negative, and that agreement is 50% all the way up to 77%. If you look at TICPLEX performance in positive agreement and negative agreement, you can, against these standards for Latvia, oh yes, Latvia, we have them, Finland, Germany, Netherlands, you can see we're outbeating the positive agreement and negative mean of most of those standard tests. If you look at the 60% here, the reason why is because they're only testing one species of Borrelia. We test against three, Bordorfri, Absley, and Guarini. They have only Bordorfri there. So this is why. In addition to this, we recently discussed with a, well, SINLAB Finland, and we tested their samples. It was over 150 samples, samples just recently, and we have shown that actually we decreased the false positive samples of their diagnosis criteria. So our test kit is good. It's, it's agreeing, it's an agreement and outbeats the academic and industry standard. It's peer reviewed and published. One second here. So we're hoping that the benefit of TICPLEX to implement it because there is some good testing. This is one of them. Other, other testing, good testing are available. We shouldn't be saying that there is bad testing for Lyme disease. There's good ones. It's just you need access to it. You need great labs to perform them, like the Eli spot and this one. CD57 is a nice one, as a scientist, to say. So we're hoping that with TICFLEX, the patient doesn't need seven different visits or 11 different visits. They need one to get a good personalized treatment protocol, okay, and a right direction so that they recover quicker. Also, TICPLEX, we're working with the Finnish government to actually lessen the burden of these patients, these unspecific patients or the summer fever patients, lessen the burden that the government has to spend in managing them because they're getting a proper diagnosis. So if you have any questions, please contact us. This article is freely accessible, and I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. It was so straightforward. Hi, Lloyd. We could just talk we to can each talk. other. Hi. Hi, how are you? <laughs> we'll share. Okay. Uh, so the technical question is, what's the similarity between antigens between the vegetative and ground body form? Similarities, yes. Okay. So <laughs> we did a 2D gel electrophoresis on these parent form in the round body, and we saw that there are actually 16 unique spots, proteins that are different and actually, current work is saying that there's, there's over 300 different genes upregulated and downregulated from Kali's works just recently. But we have shown that there are very specific proteins that are upregulated that we can see and identify and use as antigens in our diagnostic kit. So there are definitely differences in our kit. Yeah. My second question might take longer to answer, but how on earth did you get the Finnish government to cooperate with you? And can we do that in Canada? <laughs> well, that's why I'm wearing my ass-kicking boots that I bought in England. <laughs> yeah, I know. Actually, I have to say that I'm a foreigner in Finland, and I don't go by the norms. 
<laughs> by any means. I'm Canadian, living in Finland, and I am, I, I don't care about the politics there. So uh, I just push forward, and we just push forward. And my team is very international. We just push forward. So being quiet in the beginning, and then being loud. And we got actually the government, Finnish government, to give us a hell of a lot of money to validate this, this study that you just saw, even before we turned it into a commercial product. And it's because they're realizing that actually tick problem is, is a problem in Finland, and they have to do better. But we do have key opinion leaders that are trying to, trying to stop us. Uh, I, just, I just have a quite so, so the tick plex plus, when people bring the tick plus, tick plex plus to me, I basically say, this is your immunological memory. These are all the infections that you've been exposed to. So it's now the clinician's responsibility or to try to figure out which one or which multiple ones are causing your disease. Or is this past infection or is it current infection mm. or is it multiple infections? So that really is still the challenge. Absolutely. I think one of the things I, I think it'd be interesting to do is to, is to take one patient with early infection with one or multiple microorganisms that mm. are detected and then follow them sequ sequentially through their journey. Mm. Treated, untreated, relapse, incomplete treatment, PTLDS, you know, mm. partially treated Lyme disease syndrome, not post-treatment <laughs> Lyme disease syndrome. Yeah, um, so, 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 I, yeah. <laughs> so I think it would be a, a, a I think it'd be very important to, you know, we don't have excellent antigen detection methods for lots of reasons, including mm -hmm. volume of, you know, spirochutemia and bacteremia. But I think it'd be really an important study to, to sequentially follow patients. Could you, have you done that or do you, can we, you make a comment on that? Yeah, no, I, I actually, I really appreciate that you're saying this and this is the limitation as us researchers if we do not work closely with clinicians. I can say that, uh, unfortunately, we are not doing that yet, because we have three patients right now that are post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome that we're following with treatments and, and testing and stuff. But yes, let's collaborate. You have an acute patient, come. Let's do the study together, because I think only through synergy are we ever going to you know, address these things. So any clinician having an acute patient an acute patient, please, please work with us. It would be great to see them long term. Um, yes, as you, you don't have a gold standard to be, to be sure of the infection, how can you determine a sensitivity with your test? Yeah, we have to rely on the gold standard. We have to. So, so we had this table. If we go back, this positive agreement, if I can go back here, here. These are the gold standards that these countries are using. Okay, so if we're positive and they're positive, that's true positive. If they're positive and we're negative, that's false negative. So we have to compare with the gold standard that these countries are using. So whatever our response was, then with these standards. And this is the, the industry standard to use in regards to this. So this is how we did it. And the category of acute, chronic, uh, late, negative CDC criteria and IDSA, the clinicians put those patients into those groups, not us. And then we evaluated them. And then, of course, we did this, this uh, sensitivity specificity criteria. There's no other way that I can think of that can, to do this analysis to show the robustness. If anybody have any other ideas, let me know. But this is the industry standard. This is the, what the ISO criteria recommends and mandates that we, we do. By the way, FDA is following ISO 13485 in the future. So this is one of the things that they have to do all test kits. So. Yeah, sorry. Hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Sure. I'm Christine Kramer from the National Institute of Public Health in the Netherlands. Uh, I have a question. How, what's the platform of your test? And also, how do you uh, test for cross-reactivity? Because as you know, for instance, uh, Bartonella antibodies are very well known to cross-react with CMV, mm -hmm. EBV, for instance. So Excellent. actually, I'm not so surprised to see this 
uh, mm -hmm. then positivities for various yeah, the cross, microbes. Yeah, the cross-reactivity. So again, we took these patients, we tested them for the Netherlands because we, we have a customer in the Netherlands and they gave us 100 samples. They tested it for Bartonella for all the microbes. So we test them with gold standards for all the microbes and ours, and we see if they cross-react. And in, that, in those studies, they're not cross-reacting. So if they are negative in there, they're negative in ours. If they're positive in there, they're positive in ours, and, and so forth. So we look at the patterns. And in this cross-reactivity study, you have to look at the individual if they have multiple microbes, because, of course, all these tests will pick up these universal positive patients. About 1% to 2% of the patients are, are positive across platforms. But that's not this cross-reactivity. That's more of an immune dysfunction that's, that's occurring in these patients. So this is how we do it. We individually will test with a gold standard in that country what test they use for Bartonella, and then we, we see if they're cross-reacting mm -hmm. to these samples. Okay. Uh, actually, that's not the standard for the Netherlands, but there no, are various tests used, of course. This one, yeah, but it's the standard that this major clinic uses. So yeah. this, is, this is the it's point. Just one clinic, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.